Dich nicht hin. Very special welcome to any visitors we have with us. Please join us for a cup of tea or coffee in the Dunn Memorial Hall at the end of the service. It's also really nice to have Gus back leading us in worship this morning, while May is in Millport conducting the service, which includes two baptisms. Bulletins are available for collection today in the vestibule, if you haven't already collected them. Communion cards are available for elders to collect today in the waiting room. A summer fete is planned for the 11th of June. There will be a meeting tomorrow, the 4th of April, at 10.30 in the Dunn Memorial Hall for anyone who's willing to lend a hand in organising or helping on the day. If anyone's willing to help but is unable to attend the meeting, could you please let Jim Welsh know? The final Christian Aid Lent lunch will be on Wednesday in Clark Memorial Church Hall from 12 noon to 1.30. If anyone would like to make a financial donation towards the catering at Easter sunrise breakfast, there are boxes available in the vestibule and in the waiting room at the end of the service. The family have let us know of the death of Mrs. Catherine McIntyre, a former member of St. John's who moved to Glenfield Nursing Home in Greenock a few years ago. And I've been asked to read to you this on behalf of Graham McWilliams, our interim moderator. When the Kirk session met in February, the joint session clerks Douglas and Morna Ray intimated that because of changes in family and working life, they would like to step down from this office at the end of March. Morna also intimated that she would like to step down as clerk to the Congregational Board. At our Kirk session meeting on Monday evening, on behalf of the elders and members of the congregation, I thank Douglas and Morna for all that they had done during their time in office. At this same meeting, the elders of the Kirk session appointed Mr. Jim Welsh and Mr. Alistair McGregor to be joint session clerks of St. John's. Alistair and Jim will work together equally to undertake the duties of the session clerk as we all prepare for change. The members of the Congregational Board also appointed Jim and Alistair to be their joint clerks. As interim moderator, I look forward to working with Jim and Alistair through the months ahead. And that's from Graham at Williams. And I also have something else to read out. The First Minister announced that from Monday the 4th of April, it will no longer be a legal requirement to wear a face covering in places of worship or while attending a marriage ceremony, a civil partnership registration or a funeral. The government intend to offer advice for the coming weeks, but as yet, that has not been made available. It is also true that there is no longer a legal obligation to follow their guidance, but I know that many of you would want to take it seriously as we move forward on this seemingly never-ending journey towards a time where we learn to live with the virus still with high levels of COVID infection. Face coverings remain an important part of stopping the spread of coronavirus. The Scottish Government continues to strongly encourage the use of protective measures to reduce risk, including wearing face coverings where appropriate to help keep each other safe. As a congregation, we would support the use of face masks in jail when moving about the church and when seated in the church. We can continue to remove masks when enjoying our tea and coffee in the Dunn Memorial Hall after the Sunday service. Thank you. Over to you, Gus. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard, for reading our intimations. It's lovely to be back with you and I'm trying to see if I can recognise people behind these masks. Next week should be better if masks don't need to be worn, but it's lovely to be with you this morning and leading the worship here in St. John's. I was trying to remember the last time we were here and I can't remember. 
uh, is a while ago because obviously of the COVID and the changes that have taken place when Jonathan left. But before we sing our first hymn, let me read what the Apostle Paul writes, words descript- describing what a believer has become. Sorry, Peter, it was the Apostle Peter. Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're going to stand to sing a first hymn, Lord, thy word abideth. Let's join our hearts in prayer now. Let us pray. Our loving God, we thank you once more that we are able to meet together here in this sanctuary. We thank you for all who have gathered here to worship and to praise your name, to listen to your word that leads us and guides us, guides us that sheds light into our lives. Lord, we thank you for the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Above all else, we worship you and praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his willingness to leave heaven behind, for his willingness to lay down his throne and his kingly crown and to come here and to walk this earth in human flesh and come to rescue us and to take away our sin. Lord, we thank you for such a wonderful Savior. We thank you for all the blessings that you shower upon us day by day. Lord, help us never to take these for granted, but to keep reminding ourselves that you are a God of mercy and grace and how much you love us, Lord, and the extent you went to to show us and to prove your love for us. Lord, we pray that we will allow your word to speak to us this morning, that we will be listening to hear what you have to say to us this morning, and then, Lord, we will be obedient and do your word this morning. 
Lord, bless our time together. And Lord, we are not worthy to come and to stand in your presence. Lord, we know that we sin day by day. But we know that one stands in heaven who pleads for us, who has taken away our sin, who has washed us clean by his blood. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, all dealt with because he went to the cross for us, taking our sin to himself. And Lord, for this we are truly grateful and truly thankful, Lord. But Lord, as we come now, take captive our thoughts, our hearts and our minds, as we gather together, as we wait upon you, we pray your Spirit's presence with us today, that he will indeed be working in each one, Lord. Those here and those watching and listening online and who will listen later on to this service, Lord, we pray that you will speak, Lord, and that we will hear. And we ask all our prayers in Jesus' name as we say together the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm coming down here because we're going to have some fun this morning. I hope, and I hope this works. Who knows, it might. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to have you with us. I don't know your name. Do you want to tell me your name? Sophie. Sophie. Sophie, it's lovely to see you and it's lovely to have you with us. I might need your help. Would you be willing to come out and help me if I need your help? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, there's a story in the Bible about a wise man and a foolish man. A man who is very wise and clever and a man who is very foolish and silly. And Jesus tells this story about a wise man that built a house and he builds a house upon a rock. And I happen to, in good old Blue Peter fashion, have got things prepared here. Oh, if I can get down. And here we are. That's the rock. And that's the house. A wise man built his house on a rock. And the foolish man, do you know what he does? He builds his house upon some sand. And here's his house. The two houses are exactly the same, except one is yellow and one is blue. And Jesus goes on to tell us that a storm comes. It gets very windy. It gets very wet. It gets very stormy. And he tells us what happens to the houses. And we're going to see if we can emulate that, make that happen. If we can, we can demonstrate what Jesus is talking about here. So what I've got here is the rain. And I've not got any wind, but I've got the rain. And that's why all this is here, so that I don't make a mess of your lovely church. But here we are. The rain comes. You coming to see this? You coming to see what happens? Right. You coming to see what happens? Right. You watch and see what happens. So if I look. The rain comes, and what happens to that house? It's okay. Jesus says, if you build your house in the rock, it will be okay. Let's see what happens when the rain comes in the sand. Oh. 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 <laughs> it fell down. And Jesus says, that's what happens. Jesus is saying we have to build our life on him. He's to be first in our lives. He's to come and live within us. And we have to trust in him. And if we trust in him, we will be like a house in a rock. We won't fall down. We will be looked after. We'll be kept safe. But if we build our house in sand, if we build our, hands, our house on anything, our lives on anything other than Jesus, 
if we build it in ourselves, if we think we're better than Jesus, then we'll fall, we'll come tumbling down just like that house. So who's the person we're going to trust more than anybody else? Who do you think we should trust more than anybody else? I know what you think. You know it should be Jesus, don't you, Sophie? That's who we're to trust more than anybody else. We'll be hearing a wee bit more about this in the service with the, with the adults because Fiona will be coming and reading this story to us. But if you would like to go back to your seat, we're going to sing, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. you going through to your classes now. Fiona is going to come now uh, read the scriptures for us from Matthew 7, 13 to 29, which includes this story that Jesus told about the wise man and the foolish man. This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, starting at verse 13. The story of the wise man and the foolish man. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road, that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority 
and not as their teachers of the law. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Thank you very much, Fiona, for reading the scriptures to us this morning. We're going to sing again, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. This morning we're looking at the, the final verses of the Sermon in the Mount spoken by Jesus. And this whole sermon is raising questions about the preacher's authority and the preacher's identity. And when this is discovered, ask the question, what place does he have in the life of a believer? What place does Jesus have in the lives of yours and mine? And although this sermon contains a collection of ethical truths, this is not the primary reason for Jesus speaking these words. The sermon is delivered with such power and precision because of who Jesus is. And it's asking the key question, who is this preacher? Who is this Jesus? So we have to ask ourselves, who is he? Well, he is the one who confidently, confid, confidently calls God his father. We read that in verse 21. He is the one who knows which of our works will stand on the day of judgment. We read that in verse 22. He is the one who will decide if the fruit the believer produces is good or bad. He is also the one who can open or close the road that leads to life. John in his gospel reminds us clearly that Jesus is the gate and the door of the sheepfold. He is the only way to the Father. He is the true vine and only by being grafted into him can any branches be really good. Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount is asking people some questions. Do you believe and trust in what I am saying? Or do you think I'm off my head? He's asking, are my claims trustworthy or just a lot of hot air? He's saying, will my life match up to everything I'm claiming? You see, Jesus is asking 
his listeners, and all of us this morning, if we are willing to hand over our lives to him unconditionally. You see, what Jesus is saying here, he's claiming a place in the lives of people for God. Jesus is challenging people to let God rule over their lives. And the challenge is issued in three different ways. And we read about them this morning. And the first was found in verses 13 and 14, speaking about two roads. In these verses, we come across a gate and a road. And the first thing Jesus is asking is this, have you gone through the gate? Are you on the road? Now think about going through the gate like going through a turnstile at a big football stadium or maybe the London Underground or some other large event that you've been to. You've got to squeeze through a turnstile. Turnstiles, as we know, are not roomy and you have to squeeze through them to get to the other side. And if you've got a rucksack in your back, then you would normally have to take that off. And can you imagine trying to get through a turnstile with a large suitcase? It would be almost impossible. You see, there is no room to take excess baggage through this gate. There is no room for pride, no room for indecision, no room for hesitancy. What you have to do is you have to make up your mind and then just go through the gate. But do you notice here that Jesus often does in his teaching what he does he challenges his listeners to make a decision. There is no middle ground. We can't have half of us going through the turnstile and the other half of us left behind. We cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. We're not allowed to take the good and the bad with us. However, as we know, Christianity is not about being good or bad, very good or very bad. It's about being in God's kingdom or deciding not to go into God's kingdom, staying out of the kingdom. It's all about giving yourselves totally over to God, seeking His will for us, seeking to live in the light of His presence. Either that, we rebel against Him, against His will and His purpose for us. Christianity is being about on a road that starts off narrow, but opens out into the life of heaven. And the only alternative road is the broad road, which is jam-packed with self-centered people and leads to a dead end and to final destruction. This is the only choice all of us have in life. We seek the narrow road that leads to life or we seek the broad road that leads to destruction. And this is an overwhelming choice that we have to make. You see, when we read the Sermon on the Mount, we're not allowed to sit back and admire how wonderful this teaching is, is delivered by Jesus. We should be challenged by the preacher's words. We should be submitting and surrendering our lives to the preacher, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. So the first thing Jesus is asking all of us this morning is, have you entered through the gate? Are you traveling along the narrow road? And then Jesus issues a second challenge he presents us with in relation to, and this time it's in relation to a tree and its fruit. How can you tell if someone is a true disciple of the kingdom of God or not? Jesus can, and Jesus gives us the simple answer. You can tell by the kind of fruit their life is producing. You see, someone who has gone through the gate and is walking along the narrow road, they will exhibit changes in the way they now live. There will be real, tangible changes seen in the way they now behave and conduct themselves. A profession of faith makes no difference to the way we behave. If, if it makes no difference to the way we behave, it's useless. A profession of faith means absolutely nothing. It suggests that we have not received free and full salvation. It means that the Spirit's work of conversion has not taken place in the heart. But the evidence that someone is a true believer is seen in the fruit their life produce. It will be consistent, attractive fruit. 
This fruit will also give evidence that there is a gardener at work in the life of that person. That gardener is God. Now, this fruit, it should, it, it should attract others. We should be attracting others by the fruit that we produce in our lives. But does it? What exactly are others seeing when they look at our lives? And the sad thing is that there are, there are evil fruits seen in people who profess to be Christians. Arrogance can keep people at a distance. Lack of love and compassion can drive people away from God. Self-righteousness and passing judgment on others are things that prevent people from wanting Christ in their lives. And if this is what a non-believer thinks Christianity is all about, it's no wonder that people are not prepared to come to church on a Sunday. It's, not, it's no wonder that people are not being attracted to Christ. It's no wonder people don't want to have anything to do with us. People will judge the tree by its fruit. But notice too, Jesus tells us in verse 21 to 23, much of what passes for Christianity today, as it did in Jesus' day, will be shriveled up on the day of judgment and found to be counterfeit and worthless, no matter how plausible it might seem. In Jesus' day, they were able to speak for him and cast out demons in his name. Jesus sees through all falsehood, and Jesus can easily distinguish between ripe fruit and rotten fruit. And not only will people judge the tree by its fruit, so will God. Jesus is teaching us this fearsome truth. God will know if the fruit is real or not. And this is the second challenge. This is the second thing Jesus is asking us this morning. Where have we planted our roots? In the true vine, which will produce good fruit, or in the wild vine, that will produce horrible fruit? Then the final challenge Jesus gives his hearers, and, our, and it's relation to where we build our lives, and that's what we were trying to do with, the chip that, uh, with Sophie this morning and others who might be watching. Jesus tells the parable about two builders who decide to build a house. One says, one he says is wise, and the other, Jesus says, is foolish. And this, as we see, is the final instruction recorded in the sermon that brings it to an end. In these verses, Jesus is making another bold statement. In the age of secularism and pluralism in which we live, and also in which Jesus lived, he is clearly stating that what you believe truly matters. He is rejecting that you can believe what you like as long as you are sincere about it. He does not accept what many people believe, which is that people can choose their own route to climb to reach God. Jesus totally rejects pluralism. Only one low road leads to God, and that is the narrow road. I was listening to a young girl giving her testimony. She was a converted Muslim. She became a Christian at the age of 16. She had studied the Quran. She'd been brought up in a Muslim family. She studied, she, she, she learned verses in the Quran. But when she got to the age of 16, she realized that something was missing. So she started looking at Christianity. She started to read the Bible. And she realized what was missing was Jesus. So what she did was she went and told her parents, brave girl, she went and told her parents at 16 that she was relinquishing Islam and she was turning to Christianity. Her parents were horrified. Her parents were absolutely disgusted and absolutely horrified with her. And what she said to them was, well, if all roads, leads, all roads lead to God, why are you so upset? All roads don't lead to God not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only true God. And just as there are only two roads that we can travel on, there are only two ways to build, Jesus says, only two. We can either build our lives on him and his teaching, which we will discover is the solid rock, or else we can build our lives on any other religion or philosophy we find in the world, 
which is so unstable, and in the last day will come down, tumbling down and end up in a heap of ruin. And this last image Jesus gives us is a follow-up to the previous two. It's not just the question of have you entered in or has real change taken place in your life, but how are you building your life? Jesus is asking us and his hearers if we are building our lives on something that will be able to bear its weight. Are the foundations we are building on strong enough? According to Jesus, there is only one sure foundation, and he is that foundation. He alone is the rock on which we build our lives. But you know, there are many people living in our postmodern, pluralistic, revelist, uh, revel, relativist uh, culture who claim that Christianity is arrogant and exclusive. What we're not doing here, what we are not doing here is defending Christianity, saying that it is better than anything else. Often it's not, because sometimes it's shoddy, and it often is shown up by what can be seen in the best of other faith in liberal humanism. And the reason we can say what we're saying about Christianity is because Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion because religion is the human attempt to become acceptable to God. That's what these other philosophies and other religions do. That's what they say. By whatever system of belief in practice, religion is not watertight. It, might, it, it, it will never keep out the wind and the rain. And what Jesus offers is completely different. Christianity is about God seeking after us coming and looking for the prodigal, going after the lost sheep. He's doing something remarkable to make us acceptable in his sight. That's why Christianity is not a religion. It's a revelation and a rescue. Jesus is the revelation and shows us exactly what God the Father is like. John 14, 9, he tells his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. This is exactly what the Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, is like. And in, in, in Colossians 1, verse 19, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, In Jesus, in Him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. To dwell. He is the exact image, he's, he is, he's the exact replica of God. And Jesus is the one who rescues us from self-centeredness and sin. Jesus is God's rescuer. That's why Christianity is about rescue. Jesus is God's rescuer, sent by the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit to defeat sin and death and the devil by dying on the cross, taking our place, taking our sin upon himself. Paul tells us he was made to sin who knew no sin. Jesus transfers his righteousness to us. In Jesus, God has sent light into this dark world. He is there for providing for us sinners a way back to himself. And if that is the case, and if that is true, and if you really believe that, how are you going to respond? How do we respond to this? If we want to enjoy life in all its fullness, then there, there can only be one way to respond. We must make sure that we are traveling along the right road. We must be bearing fruit that is a sign of true repentance. And we must be building our lives on the rock who is Christ himself. But to do that, we must hear what God is saying and obey what God is saying. Not just hear, but also obey. How many times did Jesus say that those who truly belong to his family, are, those who are his true brothers and sisters and mother, are those who do the will of his Father? It's about doing his Father's will. Hearing and obeying what God says is what thrills his heart. Hearing and obeying what God says will cause unbelievers to realize that God is a God worthy of trusting, that believing in the gospel of Christ brings eternal life. And do you know what happens when we do obey God? We've got a tra our, our characters are transformed it affects our influences. 
It shows us itself in practical righteousness. This is what obedience does. It touches our devotional lives, radically changes our ambitions, transforms our relationships, and marks us out to be totally wholehearted servants of the King. This is what Jesus is looking for in every single one of us. Nothing more, nothing less. Is he seeing that in you? Is he seeing that in me? That's the question that we have to answer this morning. But let me finish by sharing something an old bishop of Liverpool once wrote. Bishop Ryle, I don't know if you know of him. I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. He was around sometime in the 1800s. And Bishop Bishop Ryle wrote this. Let us settle it in our minds that it will never do to be content with merely hearing and liking the gospel. We must go further than this. We must live out the gospel every moment of every day in our lives. And that's what Jesus is challenging us with today. Are we prepared to live out the gospel every moment, every day of our lives? Let's just pray. Loving God, help us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of your word. You have challenged us this morning, asking us what road we are traveling, asking us what fruit are we bearing, asking us where and who we are building our lives upon. Help us, Lord, to take what you have said, to take these words of yours and to trust them, Lord. The hearers, those who heard the Sermon on the Mount, were amazed at the authority of your teaching, Lord. So help us, Lord, to apply your word each day to our lives so that we will bear that fruit that brings glory and honor to your name. Lord, help us not to turn our backs on you, but to follow you all the days of our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think at this moment in time we dedicate the offering. Did somebody somebody bring the offering down? Is that right? Uh Uh-huh. Loving God, we thank you that we have got gifts to place in the offering, Lord, and they're giving, we're, giving, we're only giving back to you a portion of what you give to us. We thank you that you are a wonderful giver, Lord, the giver of life, the giver of your son. But Lord, we pray that you will take the gifts that we have given to you and that you will use them to build your kingdom here in Lars and further afield so that your name might be exalted and that you might be glorified. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Morag is now going to come and lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, giver of love, We pray for your love spreading around the world, an unending link between people and you, between people and other people. Help us not to be self-satisfied and selfish in the lives we live, taking our relative riches for granted and complaining when we can't have what we want. We pray for the children in the Ukraine 
who chose to take their Bibles into a bunker, that the cold of their lives may be warmed by the knowledge of your love. As the numbers of Christians in Algeria and Morocco increase, we pray for them. We pray for protection for them from those hostile to them. Touch the hearts of aggressive world leaders that they may learn to spread peace and truth instead of hostility and lies. We pray particularly for a change of heart for President Putin, that the war with the Ukraine may cease. Lord Jesus, bringer of light, we pray for all our politicians, local and national, that you may give them your vision for a just society. Keep them from self or party interest, showing them instead how we can live better together. Open our hearts to welcome refugees and to help them to build new lives in a place strange to them. We pray for and give thanks for those in Cumbria learning Ukrainian to be able to reach out to refugees. We pray for your light in our churches and especially in St. John's in Cumbria, that we may have the openness and humility to catch your vision for the future. Holy Spirit, spark of life, teach us to value the Bible and to read and understand it better. Bring us to new life, that we may be able to share our faith, however tentatively. Spark us off in the contagion of love, that we may learn better how to meet each other's needs in the church and in the community. We pray for those whose lives have been dark and difficult, in abuse or sickness, that they may come to new life. We pray for your healing touch for those in our parish who are ill. We give thanks and pray for May and Gus and their ministry here, and for Scott, Alison, Elaine and Morag in their work with our children and teenagers, and for Vicky and David as they lead the Girls and Boys Brigades. Grant them wisdom as they lead by word and example, and feed them as they feed others, we pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask for your blessing on us all, that we may go out from here, taking your love, light, and life to others. Amen. Thank you very much, Morag, for leading us in our prayers of intercession. Our final hymn this morning is from Mission Praise 372, Jesus, Lover of My Soul.
just before I pronounce the benediction, I thank you to everybody who's helped in the service this morning, from our musicians to our Bido to our readers and to our, uh, just everybody. It's just great uh, that there are so many people uh, able to take part in the service. It's not about just up here, it's about everybody working together. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us all now and forever.